Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Welcome any visitors. We're grateful that you would come and worship with us on this Lord's Day. And I was just talking with some visitors who've been coming for a little while and just saying they're so refreshed and having like-minded souls to lock shields with and fight the fight of faith. I'm just grateful for that. So we are glad to have you and welcome you into this body to seek and worship Jesus Christ. As a church, we are studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. It's been a few years, about four. Um, This morning, though, we find ourselves in a new chapter. I like to celebrate whenever we do that. This is good news. Um, Turn with me to Romans chapter 14. As Sean has just read, it's just a fascinating chapter. And the more I study it, the more gold that just comes out. And so may the Lord uh, bear the fruit of Romans 14 in our congregation. I pray that every soul would understand this truth and your heart would be gripped and your actions and will would correspond to what we'll be seeing. Uh, This section deals with what has been called Christian liberty, um, how our consciences guide us in these areas, which is so interesting to me. As you come to the Old Testament law, it it was so spelled out in so many specifics and details. You were told what threads you could use and could join together and what you couldn't in your clothes what kind of foods to the very, down to the very details with claws and what you could and couldn't. And then the Pharisees came and they added laws to the laws so that you could just spell out in absolute detail. They, they argued over what was work on the Sabbath and you could carry a feather pen but not the ink and it just kept going into more and more detail. And, and, and so now we, we are the redeemed who have been joined to Jesus Christ as we've seen in Romans. Jesus is now our justification. He makes us right before God and accepted. And we saw last week, he's our sanctification. He's the one as we abide and and believe and and commune with him, what is going to come out is fruit. And so the law of Christ is, is fulfilled, we saw in verses 8 through 10 of chapter 13, is loving your neighbor as yourself. And now there are many commands given to the new covenant believer. And they're, they're very clear. Like last week, we, we saw that uh, salvation's near, so lay aside the deeds of darkness. Don't behave improperly in carousing, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, sensuality, strife, jealousy, clear commandments, clear directives for the child of God. You're done with that life. But interesting, interestingly enough, there's not this real detailing out of how the Christian lives every issue that a believer will ever face. So, so God's concern in the new covenant was not to give you prescriptive uh, things on these conscience issues, these non-essential things. How, let, let's just have a list of everything that the church is supposed to do. God does not do that. And he's going to take on those issues now as we move into this section How are we to live in a way that is pleasing to God when we offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to Him in these areas? And and they really matter in our walk with God. So I want you to not think of them as just things that don't really matter. In this section, they really do matter. And so it's no surprise that the answer will be the law of Christ. It's going to be in this section as I come to these issues, how do I love God in them And how do I love other people in my day-to-day decisions in these non-essential issues? I look at John Owen, the Puritan said, he said, only what God has commanded in his word should be regarded as binding and in all else should be liberty of action. And this liberty of action and all other things is what we will be addressing. (laughs) So my dear brothers and sisters here at Southside, I, I want you to hear this. We are continuing on in Paul's teaching And he's teaching us, if you remember back to Romans 12, how do we offer up our body a living sacrifice? And he says, we need to know what is the will of God to give him a pleasing sacrifice. And so all of Romans 12 and 13 is, how does God want us to live? What does it look like? And he's just been guiding us beautifully. And the answer is is, is to love each other. It's just staggering that that these commands are are how we love. They, They guide and direct us in this beautiful fulfillment. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so the church of God and my own heart is prone to wander. We're we're prone to drift from these clear teachings that we will look at 
this morning. I made a commitment to preach on this section every couple of years, and uh, it's been a, a, way too many years. So I pray that it will be refreshing to the saints of God as we go through this again. Because our pride and our self-righteousness, all you need is a, a little match to get your heart where you're just going to become prideful, judgmental, condescending in these issues. And so I just want you to consider your, your own history, maybe of your own life, or just the history of the church, that the majority of conflicts that I have dealt with since coming into ministry and the schisms and the judging and the condemning and splits and arguments have, have come more over these issues than, than essential doctrinal issues. It's, it's very interesting that these are usually what, what causes the most division. And so don't get me wrong, doctrinal issues must get flushed out and they've changed the history of the world. The whole Reformation changed the world over deep essential doctrinal issues. But these non-essential issues in our doctrine and our practice have been used by the enemy to defame the glory of God by disunity in the people of God, who our whole calling is to display the unity of God from all walks of life in unity and harmony in Jesus Christ, we show forth God to the world. And this whole answer, and now in chapter 14 through 15, how do we stay unified and loving in the midst of these issues? How do we do that? How do we please God in these areas of life and conduct? And what has blown me away in my study is that to love is more important than who's right or wrong on the issue. Paul's going to bring up some issues and not even tell you who's right or wrong. He's just going to teach you how to love each other on these issues. And so most of you are like, give me the answer. What's right? What's, what's wrong? And he's not going to give you that and you're going to be frustrated. But he's going to tell you how to handle these differences in the law of Christ and how to love one another. And so uh, he's going to deal with food and drink, and holy days, and special days. And he's going to tell us that there's two groups of people. One is strong in the faith, and one is weak in the faith. And Paul just gives, just, I just keep saying, will you just give me the answer? Who, who's right? Like, I, I just need to know that. I got to know. Straighten out the weak one. <laughs> just can't you just say, be strong in faith like me? Let, let, let it take your breath away that Paul never gives anyone that satisfaction in this passage. They're bigger fish to fry. Paul teaches you the law of Christ in regards to what we act, think, and live in regards to Christian freedom and liberty. And so I dare say uh, that this is not so much about conscience issues as how do I love my brother with differing consciences on these issues. If you miss that, you will strain gnats all of your days and swallow camels. So how can the church love where there can be so much difference and thought on these kind of issues? How in the world can you dwell together in unity if you don't get these things worked out? We're, we're, we're not called to uniformity where everyone thinks and acts and dresses the same way, but we're called to this unity. So how do we get that? The church of God is not just a cluster of clones, said one commentator. God wants it that way to put his glory more, more on display. Is, is with these differences that if we could stay in unity, it makes God look even better than if everybody thought the same way on these issues. And if you want to all think the same way on these issues, they're, they're called cults and you can join them, and you can all dress, think, say, act, and do everything the same, and it's so refreshing, but kills you. How do you dwell together when everybody doesn't have the same view on birth control? On what exactly is immodesty? What, what should we eat in our diet? You know, Sean doesn't like vegetables, and I've grown to like them. <laughs> How do you sit on the same elder board with differences like that? And how do you give birth? Did, did you do it in a house or in a hospital? Can you dwell together on that difference? Whether you breastfed or bottle fed, whether you gave your kids a vaccine or didn't, whether you thought COVID was a governmental conspiracy or just a nasty virus, how do I educate my child? How, how do we get them trained? Can I go to a secular university to study or just a Christian university? Can we have wine or just juice at the communion table? Can I preach with a 
tie or flip-flops? <laughs> Which is it? Can we have tattoos or not? Can we work outside the home or not? Can we shop at Target or not? Can we watch the NFL or protest because of what goes on with the national anthem? Can we, is it the Lord's day or is it a Sabbath? Can I have alcohol or can I not? Should we celebrate Halloween or is that my outreach night? Can I have Christmas or not? Choruses or hymns? Disney, kiss before marriage or not? These issues divide the church of God. Like they're the ones that we die on. And I want you just before God to say, is that what I'm about? Because he's going he's gonna to answer these questions and he's going to go to some theological mountaintops for the answers. So here's these little molehills about conscience issues and the answers are fantastic. And, and my prayer is that we're a church that's about the mountains and your life is not, I, I just know people, your whole life is molehills. And if you get everyone to believe your little molehills, they might not become any more like Jesus Christ. And so I ask people all the time, are you going to give your life to molehills? Are you going to die and be known for your conscience convictions that you fought for your whole life? Or are you going to die for these mountains that you gave your life for and transform and change and save people? I want you to answer that with judgment day honesty. Because it's easy to get taken up with the molehills. And I've watched it hurt souls again and again. And again, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little fired up. Thanks, John. I feel better. <laughs> can, you, can you say amen in a service or not? <laughs> amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is going to be fun this morning. <clears throat> Without clear commandments on these things, this is important. How can God just leave us hanging on issues like this? Why doesn't he give us answers? I, I just feel like I want to help God. Like, we need answers. And, and then when they're addressed, to not give the answer as to right or wrong. And then what gets me even more, in verse 5, Paul's going to say, you need to get a conviction on these things. Because usually you say, to get along on these things, you just got to lighten up. And Paul's saying, you better get a conviction. I want you to get a conviction from the Word of God that is so strong that your conscience will not be moved away from it. So let's have unity and get the strongest conviction you can possibly get on these things. That's really going to help. Be convinced in your own mind and heart and, and not blow up the church with people who are prone to pride and knowing that our standard is the most holy and not letting everyone else into my godliness and my knowledge is going to hurt them. I just want people to be blessed on these issues like me. And this answer has been profound to me and I'm going to ask you to journey with me in the inspired word of God for the answer. We're going to go to God Say, so what's the answer? And will you ask God to say, search me, O oh God, in all my heart. Test me and examine me and see if there's any hurtful way in me in this area to others and to my own self. Please don't get defensive. Be pliable and let the Holy Spirit work through his word in your heart this morning. And may love in these areas reign supreme at Southside Bible Church. I think one of the most dangerous things is to become a church that dictates the answers on all these issues so you get conformity. That's not the gospel. That's not the new covenant. And we'll never produce the fruit of being joined to Jesus Christ by faith. God has a better answer. And I got one last thing before we pray. And this will just usher us into prayer. I just want you to consider this. In Romans <coughs> Paul spent two verses on developing the whole Christian mind of how you think about sanctification. Then he spent six verses on how to use our spiritual gifts in this body. He spent 13 verses to call us out to love without hypocrisy. He spent seven verses on the relationship of the church and state. And then three verses on the summary of the whole law. That's kind of big. And then he spent four verses on the right conduct in light of the return of Christ. 
And I want you to hear this. He's going to spend 35 verses on how to accept other Christians. So I hope that wakes you up and, and says there, there must be something big to this. Because I, I, I could have had 20 chapter 8 of Romans. I, I just, those truths just keep going, Paul. Can't you just cut back maybe 20 of these verses and add them to chapter 8? Like that, that was the, one of the best chapters I've studied in my life. And I'm just coming going 35 verses on how we accept one another. You think this might be weighty and big to the Apostle Paul and God. If this is not weighty to your heart, you're missing a huge part of how to live the Christian life and be pleasing to God. And I remind you that the unity of the Spirit was the longest section in Paul's application in Ephesians. Uh, Father's Day, happy Father's Day, he gave you one verse for parenting. And he gave you 16 verses on the unity of the Spirit in Ephesians. So I wonder if we're missing something really essential to the Christian life if we're not getting this. And so with that, I would like to go before God and pray that he would teach us what he has for us in such an important section. Father, we come before you, and I pray that you will get us to the very heart of this argument and what Paul's saying. God, let it be exegesis. Let it be the drawing out of the word of God to understand this and to get our convictions and how to love one another in these areas. So Father, I, I ask that you now would teach us, that you would teach us from your word and that hearts would get this. And God, that love would flow mightily in these areas in the body of Christ. God, heal us, change us and transform us this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Am I just fired up or is it warm in here? hot. So we have a deacon who could turn on some air if it's not. Praise be for Jason Sweezy. <clears throat> I'm buying you lunch. Happy Father's Day, Jason. Okay, let's look in, in Romans 14.1. Our, our first point in our outline is Paul's just going to give us a general principle and then he's going to build from that. So look with me in 14.1. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. That's, I like that. It's almost humorous. Accept them, bring them into your home, but not so you can pass opinion. You just straighten them out. Don't, don't have people into your home to get them to see it your way and make sure they finally get over their weakness. That's not what he's getting at. And so as we move in, he tells us right away, there's someone who is weak in faith and there's someone who's strong in faith. Romans 15, 1, now we who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. It's a big principle that we'll flush out. So the only way we'll ever really get this interpretation right is if we properly understand what does Paul mean by these two groups? We got to get that right. And then what were they struggling over? So it's worth a little time to set this truth well for our good. So to be weak in faith, to, to start uh, these ones, he says, they can't eat meat, and they don't drink wine in verse 2. And then there's a strict observance of feast days. Uh, there's some debate on whether it was just kind of those set-apart days uh, in the Old Testament, or is it dealing with the Sabbath? And so it, it helps us to kind of see then quickly, what were they weak in? And I want you to catch this. They weren't weak in, in faith. There, there's a definite article here is that they were weak in the faith. So they're weak in the faith. This is not that they're weak in faith in Jesus Christ alone for their justification. These are believers. These are ones who have faith in Jesus Christ to make them right with God. And so if it wasn't, in Galatians, Paul says when they, when they mess that up, may, may you be anathema, may you be con condemned, consigned to judgment. He, he wouldn't be sitting here going, abide with someone who doesn't get faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 6 he tells us they're not weak in love and they're not weak in gratitude to God. They give thanks to God and what they're doing. They're grateful. And so they're, they're, they're not abstaining, then hear this, because they think it will get them justified. So it's not an argument of if I don't eat meat or don't do this, I can get right with God. That is not the issue. And so weak is with respect to the faith. And what he means then is the outworking of their faith. 
uh, what they approve or disapprove in their Christian liberty. So these freedoms that we're talking about, they're, they're weak in, in the trajectory of grace and what they can and can't do. So it's their understanding of the gospel of grace. How can I enjoy all things that God has made? How can I have freedom and thank God for all these blessings? There are things that he's not all the way free in his conscience to partake of or to refrain from. So his conscience is guiding him, and there's just not freedom to do these things. So how to work out my freedom in Christ as a believer is where they're weak. That's where they're going to keep growing in this as they walk in grace. And so what I've seen is all of our journeys are a trajectory in growth. And God just keeps teaching us the outworking of the gospel and how to live into the fullness of grace in all areas of life. And you just keep learning and being set free. And so this is big of how do we treat each other if we're at different places on the trajectory of understanding Christian freedom. And so in our passage, the issue that Paul is talking about is kind of boiled down to this. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they had forbidden foods that were unclean foods. They were from the clean laws. Uh, two things, to keep Israel's nationality, national identity and to, that they could go into the presence of God. They couldn't go into the presence of God without cleansing. And so that, that's where this is coming from. And Christ comes and we saw he fulfills the law and he now makes us clean and acceptable before God the Father. But there were people who lived their whole lives under this ceremonial law, and you just don't shake it overnight. I've been shaking some of, some of my legalistic thinking that I grew up in for 20 years, and God continues to renew my mind in it. Acts 15, you had the Jerusalem Council, how to work out circumcision in these laws. You got Peter and Cornelius and Peter going, God says to eat this unclean thing. And Peter's like, I've never eaten anything unclean. And, and then God shows them that I've made all things clean now, Peter. So get this, they're Christians who are born again, members of the church who are weak in the faith. And for now, making the kingdom of God about these external things sometimes, instead of really understanding the heart all the way. And they're binding themselves under things that were not commanded by God. In fact, they had been set free from these things. And they were weak in knowing the fullness of what it meant to be in Christ and the freedom of what we have now in these areas. And so I pray that you, you get this. And then the strong had faith that I can eat meat. I can drink wine. And every day is the same. There's no special days. Every day is to be lived for God. And so they had knowledge of what Christ had set them free to and how to work it out in their day-to-day -day life. They had what we call freedom in Christ. So they were stronger in faith in the outworking of the Christian life. And so the difference between weak and strong in this faith was causing problems in this church. It's bringing hurts and judgments, and they're condemning one another, and they're pushing each other away. It's a big deal. And it's hurting the unity of the Spirit of us showing forth our oneness in Christ. So this issue is, is, a, is a great problem to this church in Rome. <clears throat> so at the outset of this verse, we can conclude the following. And I really want you to understand this. All Christians are not equal and identical in the outworking of their faith. There are weak and there are strong in the faith in every body. In justification and regeneration, the work of the Holy Spirit and making us new, we're all equal. We all have an equal footing before God because we're in Christ. So everyone is equally accepted as you sit here this morning. But in sanctification, there's difference. John says he writes to the babes and he writes to those who are mature and the faith. Just simple. We all grow differently. Some weak, some strong, some growing in their theology, and some growing in the outworking of it. We come from different backgrounds, diverse prejudices, preferences, and we all come together in this body by faith in Jesus Christ. And I just want you to hear this. 
we're different. Do you see how dangerous it would be if you just made uniformity with all of our differences and different thoughts and where we're at? You, you would destroy one another if you just tried to force everybody into this one square of here's how you do this. Unity of believers in light of our great diversity. So there, we're all in different places in sanctification by the grace of God and his timing. So I just want you to, to embrace this whole body that has everybody at a different place instead of everybody needs to be like me. It's just, isn't that freedom? What a beautiful design by God. So then we ask ourselves, so how do we handle these kind of people with these differences? How can these people with these big of differences and a multitude of them dwell together in unity in the spirit of the bond of peace? How do you handle them? And many times in this text, you stay away from them. You don't have them over for dinner. And maybe you gossip about them. Maybe you mock them. Maybe you pray for their children that they have to live under such a parent. You wish they could figure this out with you. If I just had five minutes, I know they would see it my way. You know what I'll do? I'm just going to post it on social media. And then everybody can be strong like me. This meme will solve everything. Issue's over. It's never happened to me. So what do we do when we're judged in these areas of conscience? Should we judge or look down on others on these issues? Hurt and harm again that this is done. I get why we have two chapters. Uh, Paul, I would love 20 more on these issues. So what do we do? Come with me to verse one. I think you now know what the issues are and it makes this command all the better. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. And so what God wants us to do with these differences is actually receive each other. And this is a beautiful Greek word. It's, it's a very intimate word. It's very brotherly. And it, it, it meant to welcome into your home with open arms, to accept one into your private circle, to kind of bring him into your, your people. And it's the same root, but a different preposition in John 14, 3. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So this is a warm-hearted reception. It's open love. But we're just so different. How can I have lunch with him if he's chowing down on pork sandwiches? And then he orders wine. And it's on the Sabbath day, nonetheless. So we, we just have to agree to disagree. It's okay. I'll just walk by you on Sundays and give you a little nod. And Paul says, no, accept them, love them, bring them in with these differences. I'll bring you into my home and I'm going to show you which way is up. No, don't pass judgment on his opinions. I'm going to put him in a hermeneutical pretzel hold till he says uncle. (laughs) Bring him in and freedom, you can love him. And Paul's going to show you how to set you free from that burden that you're carrying to make everybody as wise as you are in these areas. Receive him. You don't even have to have the same conscience conviction to receive him. Just love him or her. You're dry. This has hit me so hard. Your drive is not to make them see it your way, but to make sure they live by faith, to love God and love others. And that's what the rest of this passage is going to flesh out. Is your greatest burden, how do I help them live by faith to love God? And if I remove their conscience conviction without truth and journey, Paul's going to say, you might destroy them. The conscience, we'll flush this out as we go, is a gift from God to protect you. And now my conscience is convicted of this, and maybe a stronger brother says, no, you need to do this. And I just jump in, and it's not a faith. Paul's going to say it's sin. And so you, you got to get this. You're hurting people to just try to make them and shove them into your little square hole or round peg. I don't know if that's right. You're just trying to push them in. You are more burdened This dear brother or sister, I want you to live by faith. 
And when you stand before God, you're going to give an account for your convictions and what you chose and how you lived. I just want to help you as your brother to encourage you to live by faith, not my, not my fleshed out convictions. And isn't that freedom? That's way better than feeling like I got to make everyone see it my way. I love you too much to hurt you that way. I just want to love you and teach you how to live before God in this way. How, how, do you hear this? I, you don't hear this a lot. That's why I think there's two chapters on it. Can you discuss it? Of course. A, a good church can talk about these. He says, have your own convictions. And there's a way to talk and to try to lead people in this trajectory of freedom. And so it's, it's love. It's relationship. It's a journey. There's a big difference between I got to get you to see it my way versus I want you to be free to enjoy the fullness of what you have in Christ. The heart is different. Heart of it. Make sure that they do it under the Lord, his glory. If he eats or doesn't, he gives thanks to God. If he celebrates or day or not, he gives it to God. That he has a clear conscience. It's a faith and he's fully convinced in his own mind. That is love. That is the bigger burden of your heart not to be right. Please hear that. That's bigger than being right. The law of Christ right here. And what most say is, I'm trying to love them so they can get this right. That's not it. Loving them is that they do it by their own faith to please Jesus Christ. That's what I want for every one of you, even if you're different than my conscience convictions. So this is not commandments. If they're commandments, we lead them to repentance. This is where there's not a commandment. There's, a, there's these liberty conscience issues that aren't sin either way. If it's sin, we, we, we love each other and we call each other to repentance. So here's the convincing part, convicting part. <clears throat> uh, verse 3, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. What's his reason? Prepositional phrase, for God has accepted him. God's accepted him. Why do we receive him? Because God's accepted him. Can we receive each other the same way that God receives each other? I want to show the same love and delight that the Lord does. I, I receive you freely the way God receives all of us. So I can't receive you because you don't have all my convictions. Think about the Lord who everything he says, is everything's perfect. And he receives you in Christ. It's powerful. These issues are not the grounds that we admit people into church membership. I've been a part of that. You can't come into this church unless you sign a thing that says you won't dance, smoke, chew, or go with girls who do. You can't play cards, not even pinochle. Now, that's not even a conscience issue. <clears throat> the, the only music you can ever listen to is Gettys and Sovereign Grace, and anything outside of that is sin. Dresses that have to touch your ankles, all your tattoos must be covered up. That is man's way to bring harmony and unity. And God says it brings disunity and hypocrisy and harm. And for some of you, you grew up in that, and it is hard to discard. I get it. But you have to. By the word of God, you're going to have to start releasing that way of thinking. Receive one another. Before God, is that how you treat the body of Christ? I pray that your hearts would get what Paul is saying. This is the mountain, and your most holy convictions are the molehill. Please get this. And this is big. This is big to my heart. If you're here and you feel rejected or judged because you don't look like the norm, because you got a tattoo across your face, or because of your race, maybe your background was prison, you've gone with a rougher crowd, you can't even spell homeschool. You love beer, but you don't get drunk. It's just wrong if you feel that way. And I pray that the whole body of Christ, you know, it, it can be in your own mind, and I want to set you free from that. 
but it could be what people do. And I pray that you so get this that no one would ever feel that way. Christ has received you from whatever background, wherever you come from. He's received you, and the body of Christ receives you because you're in Christ. I don't care what your background is. I just love that you know Jesus Christ and you're one with him. And I pray that there will be more and more freedom for anyone who walks in that looks different than Ken Murphy. I I just pray for people who look different than Ken Murphy. That's your blessing. (laughs) So please don't try to be where everyone's got to look and act the same. And, And if you ever don't receive someone because of something like externals and these convictions. You're in, you're in sin. And God's received them. And you're looking at them going, I'm scared of that person. I'm, I'm not going to talk to him. I welcome you. So I pray that those walls would just break down in the gospel of Jesus Christ and that there would be none of that in this body. Just before God, even wrestle in your own heart, do I have any of that? And if you do, you, you go to the cross and let go of it this morning and go love and get someone into your home that scares you. (laughs) Invite them in and love them and care for them. Repent if you have that in your heart. How's it going so far, guys? How's it taste? Like vinegar? (laughs) You're getting it. You're getting it. So that's our general principle. That wasn't bad. So now he's going to move into some examples in case you're sitting here going, I don't get what you're saying. So thank you, Paul. Let's go look at an example in verse two. One person has faith that he can eat all things. That's been my battle since I got saved. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Did you you hear that, kale eaters? (laughs) They can only eat vegetables. No, I promise you that's not what it means. I'm going to flush it out. (laughs) So what is the issue? It's eating meat or only eating vegetables. And there's a lot of thought on what Paul meant here. I'm going to throw out a couple ideas. I can't can't die on the hill, but I think I'm getting pretty close by the text. (laughs) Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians 8, go home and read 1 Corinthians 8. Paul addressed a Gentile problem that was going on in the church. So the pagans would come and they would worship their idols and they would, they would give meat offerings. And, and here it is to, to our pagan God. And, and, the, and the carcasses were not burned. And like any good entrepreneur, the priests would sell them uh, to the local vendors. So meat offered to idols is we're selling it to make money. And they're, they're now in, you're buying them in the shop and they would sell it in the market. And there arose a big dispute in the church If I go to a friend's house and he puts before me this discounted meat that he bought in the market, should I eat it or not? Sounds like almost like the Halloween issue. Should I? This this was devil worship. Can I I be a part of it? The the weak say, no way. It's polluted. My conscience can never eat meat like that. I came out of that stuff. I'm not going to eat meat. And the strong go, it's just meat. Give thanks to God and put some A1 sauce on it and enjoy it. (laughs) That's what's going on. But in Romans 14, 14, if you'll read it with me, Paul says, I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. (laughs) And it makes us begin to think then it's back to that what's clean and what's unclean, what's kosher. And so that might have been more of the struggle is, is some would eat no meat because we're not sure if it's kosher. And so we can't eat it. And, and the others are saying, man, if we give thanks to God, we can eat it now. We don't have to eat kosher meat anymore under the new covenant. And so that's a big issue. And that's some of the stuff that is going on in Rome. And so in verses three through four, our third point, Paul's now going to give him a charge. And this, this does get a little too close to home. Verse 3, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. We'll come back to verse 4 in a second. So there are two dangers that are going on in this church. The strong are eating their meat, and they're regarding with contempt the weaker conscience in this area. And they're just kind of looking down at them. 
You can't eat meat? I feel sorry for that poor slob. Like, just grow up. Come have some meat with me. So they're just looking down. And then the weaker are looking up from their vegetables, going, look at them. They got no respect for God and kosher and what's clean, and they're just stuffing meat in their face. I wonder if they're even Christians. How can they do that? So the strong are regarding with contempt. The Greek word means to view them as nothing, to look down on them. And I've seen this in our own body. You, you look down on people that don't have your convictions. It's, a, it's the same word in Luke 18, 9. Oh, I got to keep moving. With the Pharisee and the publican, and, and he says, look at me, I fast, I tithe, I pray. Not like this little publican here. I thank you, God, that I'm not like him. That's the word. That's this picture going on here. And some commentators I read think that this was going on at the love feasts. <laughs> so get the picture. The strong are porking out. They're looking up from the roast pig and they're looking at these people going, they're clueless. And one man said this, they're receiving all their food, but not their brethren. They're so strong in the faith, but they're missing what the whole faith is about. And I've seen this. You're so proud of your liberties that you're not considering your brethren. The only thing that matters is I'm free. Give me my core's light. It doesn't matter that I'm standing here with someone who's an alcoholic and battled it in his past. See, you're so strong in your freedoms that all that matters is I'm free. I hear this all the time. All that matters to you is I'm free. And you've missed the law of Christ. It's not enough just to be free. You need to love your brothers and sisters. There's something bigger than just your freedom. The glory of God and the love of others. So don't look down smugly upon a child of God. That can't be the way we deal with one another. Thinking you're better, your maturity to enjoy your freedom in Christ, and you're just condescending everyone else. You walk around, you just have a shirt that says, I'm strong in the faith. And you just look down on everybody that you see. You roll your eyes. <laughs> They're so stupid. They're blind. Can't believe anyone could believe that. You're never going to get unity with that. Yeah, you're smart, you're cool, but you're not building up the body of Christ. This thinking and this spirit, it breeds disunity and it feeds pride. Show of hands, anyone feel guilty? Yeah, it's the right crowd. The rest of you, uh, I think you're hiding. I think you're hiding out. So now the weak, he says, they're judging. And they see their brother eating and they say, look at that man, they're, they're antinomians. They're just broken down what God has established. There's no fear of God in those little meat eaters. At best, they're immature. At worst, I wonder if they even know Jesus Christ. The tendency to sit in judgment upon others in these areas is the sign of weakness, not strength. It's the weak Christian that stands ready to pass judgment upon the souls of those who partake of liberties that you don't feel comfortable with. And so let me help diagnose this. We have a weak brother He's not clear, and he wants to make sure he's right. So he makes a lot of rules and lists. When I first got saved, I was like, just give me my lists. I, love, I loved lists, and now I can have my rules. And the reason was I love God, and I want to please him. So give me that. And so he's not content to just do it for himself. He wants everybody else to comply to his list. And some of you walk in here with these big lists, and your goal at Southside Bible Church is to get everybody else to keep your lists. You're so terrified that he would go wrong. He can't drink, he can't eat, no TV. He judges himself and other in terms of these things alone. You can't live in a house over 400,000. Uh, you can't buy, you, you have to buy used clothes and gunny sacks if they're available. Um, your kids can't go to the local high school and you, your kids can't play with cap guns because those kids grow up and shoot people. So why should I not do this? It's true, isn't it? Well, the answer is so simple. God has accepted him. God has received him. The only one who's truly holy has accepted this person. And the only one who truly knows the standard of righteousness has, has received him. 
you're pushing away one whom God has embraced. You're pronouncing judgment on one whom God has said no condemnation, justified. And you're saying your judgment is better than God's. Your standard is higher and more holy than God. I had a, a brother one time say to me, a brother in Christ, wasn't Steve or Tim or Mike, said, I always am, am going to choose the most holy way on these issues. I'm like, man, I admire you. You're always going to choose the most holy way? In our, in our text here, that's not a good, a good start. You're rejecting him for whom Christ died. He has union with Christ. He's loved. And he's going to one day shine like the noonday sun in the new heavens and the new earth. God will see to it. So let our attitude reflect God's opinion toward him. God's embraced him. God hasn't made eating meat an issue of fellowship with his brother or sister. He hasn't made that the issue. That has to knock you off your high horse. Woe to us if we erect barriers that God has knocked down. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you, tr you tithe mint and dill and come in from your little gardens. You measure out all the mint, all the dill. Here's my 10%. And you've neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. And some are experts at mint and cumin. And, and there's something weightier here of how we receive and love. So I want you to, the last thing is just consider God's role and I'll send you on your way. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls. And he will stand. For the Lord is able to make him stand. I want to take that burden off your back. It's a great illustration. The servant, it's not doulos. It was the word for a house servant. And it was one who had a close relationship to the master of the house. And this house servant is not accountable to any other servants. He doesn't go around going, I wonder what these servants think. The only thing that mattered is what does my master think? And I want you to picture one of these servants coming up to a servant going, you know, your service isn't what it should, should be. You're doing it wrong. In fact, you're just a joke of a servant. You need to do it like me. And the response is, I only answer to the master. Whatever he, whatever he wants is what I want to do. The point is simple. You're a household slave to Christ. Christ is the master, and that is who slaves answer to. So just hear this. They're going to answer to Christ, not you. That's who we look to. Our model, our example, our marching order comes from Jesus Christ. Who are you to set the standard for everyone else on these issues? Let it be your own conviction. What will please my master the most? I need that from every heart. What's going to please God? I, I look at this and I pray, and my answers are not, I just, I just like beer. I just like wearing short skirts. Just what I like. Get over it. Instead of what pleases God. And I'm going to stand before him in judgment. We're going to look at that in a few weeks. What you need to look at is receive one another. And if he doesn't adopt my standard, I know he's going to fall. And I want you to hear good news. To his own master, he stands or falls. And stand he will. This is the perseverance of the saints. For the Lord is able to hear that. He's able to make him stand without your convictions. It's to Christ that we stand or fall. And, and I just hear that. Stand we will by the grace of our master. And, and they can do it without my stances. He will not make shipwreck of his faith without me. The Lord is able to make him stand, and we're right back to Romans 8, 28. So the point is God will cause us to stand. His power is greater than our convictions to make a brother stand or fall. If we doubt this power, we must make up lists and hold them up to everybody else. So the Lord has more concern and investment in the weaker brother than you ever could. That's the freedom I want you to walk away with this morning. And because it's Father's Day and I'm a father, I can go a little longer. So my, my kids asked, what do you want for Father's Day? Could you preach a little longer, Dad? So I, I just want to love them. I just feel obliged. Jordan's not here, is he? He would never say that, but I love him. <clears throat> so hear this as we close. I pray that this will never be a church 
that we all agree on non-essentials. It's healthy. So I, I'm not, I don't want us all thinking and acting and dressing and doing everything exactly the same, okay? These differences will teach us more about Jesus Christ than everybody being in unity. And I want you to really pray over, do we receive one another with these differences? Go deep in your heart how you view others. Are you judging with these differences? Are you looking down on people who don't have the freedoms that you have? I pray this Father's Day, teach your children well in this area. This ship shipwrecks more kids. I inherit a lot of Pharisees who were taught all these things are rules that you got to keep instead of conscience issues. And I, I wonder if we'd train them more on the heart of this versus just giving them their thousand standards to go mess up churches with. So I just pray, train your children well in this spirit. And a healthy church talks about non-essentials. They're important. I want you to hear that. But the flavor is we're about the big things, like God being able to make us stand. And we've been received in Jesus Christ, and there's going to be a judgment day at the end of all of this. He's going to just take these lofty high doctrines, and I pray that that's what you get lost in. And these things are important, but I'll tell you what, is if you make them the, the mountains, you're going to have a lot of shipwreck and a lot of harm and hurt, and, and you grow from these big doctrines. Sovereign grace that makes you stand. That is what will build the unity of the Spirit, is those big things and us understanding these conscience issues and how we deal with one another so that this body could be built up into its head and that the world would see a unity in all of our disunity and want to know what is the hope within us. To God be the glory for this beautiful teaching in Romans 14. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the beauty of this. God, I pray now that your word would work in each and every heart, that our pride would not rise up and start taking issues with illustrations or, or things that bothered us. God, let us, let us take heart before our God that you've received the weaker and the stronger. God, would we walk in your footsteps and go find those that we want to walk away from or those who are different or have different convictions. Oh God, all be received in this body the same way that you have received them. Break down prejudices and, and just judging and condemning God. Would you heal that in every heart this morning? These are hard things to diagnose. We do them so freely that you don't even realize it's the air that we breathe. So Lord, change us, set us free in the law of Christ to love one another in these issues and to help each other live with clear consciences before our God. And that that would be the joy of every heart to help each other journey that. Lord, please do mighty things in Southside Bible Church through these truths. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen.